morning as we continue our study in this letter that Paul wrote to the believers in Christ who lived in the region of Galatia, we are stepping into the first verses in chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, open them to Galatians chapter 4, and I'd like to read verse 1. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. Last week, we closed with an illustration that would have resonated with the people who lived in that region. When Paul wrote about being clothed in Christ, the illustration used there by Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, was powerful. In Roman and Greek households, back in Paul's day, it was a common practice to employ well-educated slaves to handle the care of their children. These servants would care for the needs of their children all day long and probably all through the night. And in some well-to-do homes, some of the wealthier homes, the servants were even given the task of being teachers in teaching the children, protecting the children, even disciplining the children. And these servants were more like guardians who were preparing the children for adulthood. And when that child reached the age of adulthood and no longer needed that guardian to watch over them, a celebration was held. This moment was marked by a changing of clothes. The child who was now a young adult would throw off their childish clothing and put on the adult toga. It was like the, a rite of passage. So Paul wrote in his letter, clothe yourselves with Christ, indicating this same rite of passage that takes place in a believer's life. Today, as we step into the next set of arguments that Paul used, Paul expands on this illustration by saying, here's what I'm saying when I'm writing this. So we think about this rocket aimed at sinking the false teachings. Let's ask the Lord to help us understand what Paul was writing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us as we look at this next argument. Help us understand what Paul was saying. Help us apply it to our lives today. Amen. One. Let's read some more of what Paul wrote. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children... We were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. The illustration used here of a son or a daughter moving from childhood into adulthood was a powerful image. Because no matter who the father of that child was, as long as that child was a child, they were under the supervision of a servant. The father may have held a, a very powerful position of authority in the country, but that child was still under the command of that servant. The father may have been very wealthy, owned large areas of land, many cattle, but to that child it really made no difference. They were still under the authority of that guardian. The servant themselves would have been under the authority of the master of the house, but the child would have been even lower than that slave under the authority of that slave. So the missile that Paul was delivering into the, the heart of these false teachings 
was aimed at destroying the believer's hope of trying to grow in the relationship with the Lord by trusting in the law. Paul was saying that the law was like being a child under the authority of all of these layers of control. The child may have been an heir, but is enslaved by all of the bureaucracy over them. As we discussed last week, the law was like those guardians, teaching and disciplining a believer, hoping to prepare that believer for adulthood. Which means, when those false teachers were leading the Galatian believers into using the law as the way or the means of growing their relationship with the Lord, they were actually moving those believers back into religious bondage, back into spiritual infancy, back into immaturity, childhood. By adhering to the law, they were building a relationship with the law, not building a personal relationship with the Lord. Ultimately, we would call this idolatry. They were replacing their personal relationship with the Lord by listening to the law. See, this process is what we call today legalism. Placing our trust and our faith in our ability to comply to the rules and the regulations as a way of developing a strong relationship with the Lord. Instead of just listening to the Lord, following him personally, a person would be listening and adhering to their personal interpretation of the laws and all the rules and the regulations. It doesn't make the rules wrong. We just shouldn't honor the rules as if they are the Lord of our lives. It denies what Christ has already accomplished in us and for us, and is like stepping back into childhood, placing ourselves back under the power and the authority of a guardian. Paul, in writing this letter, was saying through faith in what Christ has already done, they were being clothed in the very righteousness of Christ. It was like stepping out of childhood into adulthood with being clothed in Christ. They were moving into full sonship, full daughtership with the Father, with all of the rights and the privileges that were associated with that family, which meant as heirs, they held power, they held authority over those they had just been servants to. The guardians were now their servants. The law was now subservient to them. Through faith in Christ, a switch in position takes place. In this missile attack on the teachings from those false teachers, Paul's illustration was powerful. The believers who had moved into adulthood through trusting in Jesus Christ became rich. They became powerful. While, of course, the servants or the guardians they had previously been under the control of, they were still servants and they were not rich. As heirs to the riches of the Father, they were now directing the affairs of those who were still under the bondage of the law. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but are a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Paul was highlighting this change of status because as adults, sons and daughters of the father, they now had a very secure future. While those servants, well, they were still servants. Their futures were limited by who they were and the position they held. So Paul was asking, why would you want to stay in the role of a child? And another important point, those believers who were living in Galatia would have understood because of this illustration, 
was the reality that a child who had not yet come of age, who was still under the control of a guardian, was not eligible to inherit. Only a child who had moved into adulthood, who had become of age, would be eligible to be heir of the estate. And don't forget, those under the law were still in bondage, trying to be good enough to even earn some kind of promotion, to move themselves out of that position. But of course, never making the grade, because the law was not designed to do that. And following the false teachers of those false beliefs, that the believers in Galatia were refusing the power of the gospel, and they were accepting the weakness of the law. They were entering into the poverty of the law. Galatians 4, 8 to 11. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak, and miserable principles. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I, I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. The law never made anyone rich or more powerful because it was not designed to accomplish those kinds of goals. The only things the law was capable of doing was revealing weakness, but it still had no ability to correct it. It showed spiritual bankruptcy with no plan for recovery. So the tragedy of stepping into those false teachings was that it appears to be spiritual. It appeared to have power to help, but appearances are totally deceiving in this case. The teachings of those false teachers could only send those believers back into the bondage of childhood. It's like the story of the ship's captain who makes the broadcast over the passenger ship's intercom system. He says, this is the captain speaking to all of my passengers. Do not be alarmed. By the rumors you are hearing, <laughs> it's true. We have been sailing for hours aimlessly. <laughs> We're lost because our navigator lost his bearings through the storm that happened last night. But the good news is <laughs> we're making really good time. <laughs> In following the instructions of those false teachers, the believers in Galatia had lost their way. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know what direction they were heading in. And they were being told, wow, you're making such great progress. But all was not lost. Their master navigator, the Holy Spirit, was ready and waiting to correct their voyage. If they would simply place their faith back into Jesus Christ, open themselves up to the privileges of being heirs of the Father. And the same simple steps of faith are available today for anyone who discovers they have been attempting to order their lives through trusting in the law instead of placing their faith in Jesus Christ. It's like the story of the two children in the story of the prodigal son. The one son, after bankrupting himself through the seductive pleasures of this world, decides to return home by placing himself under the authority of his father by becoming a servant of the father, by placing himself back under the control of others, placing himself into bondage as a child. But the father <laughs> would have nothing to do with it. The father reinstated his son as full heir. 
The father well, doesn't want his son to stay as his child. He puts the family ring on his son's finger. He cloaks his son in the robe of adulthood, indicating the rite of passage. The prodigal son is full heir once again. But with all of this happening, the second son complains because the prodigal son had been reinstated as full heir. The, the older son felt he had been mistreated. In his estimation, he had not been lifted up to the status of an adult son as full heir, and he didn't run away. He hadn't squandered wealth. He had done everything the law required of him. <laughs> what does the father say? Son, you have always been with me. You, you are my heir. Everything I have is yours. See, what was the father saying? Son, why are you attempting to earn my pleasure in you or earn your, your status as my son through trying to be good enough? You, you are my son. You are my heir. Live like it. The second son had been choosing to live as a child instead of living as an adult heir. This is the condition of some believers in Christ today. They are heirs to the, the riches and the authority of God's kingdom because they belong in the family of God. But they choose to live under the guardianship of the law as children, trying to earn what they have already been given. May we live as heirs to the King through faith in what Jesus Christ has already done. May we see our position as adult heirs through faith in Jesus Christ. And let's embrace it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what Jesus did on the cross and what you have accepted, you have given in return to us through the gift of redemption and salvation. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are heirs. Heavenly Father, may every one of us live as full adult heirs to the King. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.